In the southwest corner of France, surrounded by vineyards, there's a town that seems to have been transported straight from a fairy tale. The Languedoc Basin, nestled between the Pyrenees to the south and the Montagnois to the north, is home to Carcassonne. The old town rises above the plains, a seemingly chaotic jumble of pointed towers and stepped walls. But Carcassonne is more than just an impressive sight. It's a town with over two and a half thousand years of history, which today preserves some of the finest examples of Roman and medieval military engineering. Its importance has got a lot to do with where it is in the world. Situated relatively close to the Mediterranean coast and the Spanish border, it was the site of a Roman oppidum, an intersection of trade routes overlooking a river at a convenient shallow fording point. It was one of those places you'd end up if you were going, well, anywhere. So it was little wonder that a town started, grew and thrived there through the centuries. Successively inhabited by Romans, Visigoths and Saracens, it was in the hands of Viscount Raymond Roger Trencavel in 1209 when the city was besieged by Crusaders. The siege didn't last long, and the Viscount was scandalously captured during a parley to later die in his own dungeon. After that point, and at the height of Carcassonne's strategic importance between France and Spain, the city was heavily fortified. Buildings and structures were added to transform the city into the ultimate defending machine. With its new defences, Carcassonne never again succumbed to a siege. Look at the city today, and the science of surviving a siege is everywhere. All you need to do is look. It starts before you even reach the city. Despite being situated in a broad, low-lying basin, the old town is built on a natural hill of hard sandstone and quartzite. This extra elevation gives better visibility of the surrounding countryside, allowing the inhabitants to spot attackers from many miles away in all directions. On one side, the River Ord provided an obstacle that must be crossed before approaching the city, slowing any attackers down. But the quartzite bluff does the same job around the rest of the city. With gravity on the side of the defenders, it would be a difficult uphill struggle to even get close to the fortified town. And if that wasn't enough, the hard rock, as opposed to the softer muds and silts of the surrounding plains, would have frustrated any attempts to undermine the defences. It would be too hard going, taking too long to be a sensible option for attackers. Once you reach the city itself, the first engineered obstacle you'll encounter is the dry moat. Moats are a familiar feature of castles all over the world, with their dark, stagnant waters a slimy discouragement to any approach. But it takes an awful lot of water to fill and maintain a moat, and in some places, like Carcassonne, where water's quite hard to come by, maintaining a swimming pool of doom just isn't feasible. But it still makes a lot of sense to dig a big ditch just in front of your walls. That's essentially what a dry moat is, a big ditch. Our prospective attackers would have to manoeuvre themselves and their siege engines down into the moat before they can reach the walls. That takes time, time that the defenders can use to assemble troops and open fire. Being several metres down in a ditch makes the walls you're about to attack several metres taller too, so your siege engines and ladders will have to be several metres taller as well. Plus, once you're in the moat, it's pretty hard to get out again. Sloping banks take more time again to scale, while arrows rain down. So, you face the curtain wall. Carcassonne's outer curtain wall stretches for 1.3 kilometres and completely encircles the town. It's called a curtain wall because the solid sections of wall resemble curtains strung between the 18 towers at regular intervals. But we'll come to the towers in a minute. The walls themselves, like most of Carcassonne's fortifications, are made from strong, coarse sandstone that's cut into large interlocking blocks weighing at least 150 kilos each. From the outside, the walls are an imposing vertical obstacle, but they're far from a passive barrier. On the inner face, they're equipped with a chemin de ronde, a protected walkway that allows defending troops to walk the length of the walls without being exposed to attackers' projectiles. The walkway's protection comes in the form of an extra elevation of blocks on the outer edge, but defenders still need to fight back, and a solid wall would prevent them from doing that. So that raised wall is crenellated broken up into vertical projections called merlins, separated by gaps called crenels. This is absolutely classic castle architecture, dating back as far as 1066. A rectangle with crenellations at the top 
is instantly recognisable as a defensive building. The merlins are always at least as wide as a man's shoulders and provide shelter for a defender at rest, while the crenelles in between allow him to see beyond the wall, fire projectiles and drop unpleasant objects on would-be attackers. But the crenels work both ways. Being able to see your attackers means your attackers can see you too, and attack you. How do you get one up on your foes then, from within your Shemin de Ronde? Enter the arrow slit. From the outside, they're not much to look at, and that's kind of the point. Just a narrow slit makes for a small target to get an arrow through, but from the inside, it's another story. On the inside of the Merlin, the walls to the side of the arrow slit are cut away, in what's known as an embrasure. This allows an archer to squeeze in close to the front edge of the wall while still staying protected. It also means that they can pivot right and left around the arrow point to cover a pretty big horizontal range. Plus, by moving the weapon up and down the vertical slit, an archer has plenty of control over their vertical range to target assailants when they were both far from and close to the wall. They could shoot downwards, at as little as five degrees from vertical, while a widened opening at the bottom of the slit, called a fishtail, gave them a better view of the bottom of the wall. So yeah, arrow slits are pretty good for defence, and Carcassonne went for them in a big way. All in all, there are more than a thousand arrow slits around the walls, towers and defensive buildings in the city, each a perfect staging point for a defending archer. Arrow slits do have blind spots, though, to the extreme right and left where the embrasure limits an archer's movement. That means it's very hard for an archer stationed along the Chemin de Ronde to fire along the walls. For that, there are towers. Carcassonne's many rounded towers along the curtain walls have arrow slits all around them, which provide covering fire along the walls to cover any blind spots. But the design of the towers offers even more defence. The rounded shape is much more effective at deflecting projectiles compared to a flat wall that bears the full force of whatever's thrown at it. The walls at the base of the tower are thicker than higher up, too. Not only does this make it harder to break through, but the sloping surface, called a talus, makes it harder for siege engines to get close to the top of the tower. Looking closely at the stones that make up the tower, they don't have smooth flat faces on the outside, but have a large central lump, called a boss. These bossed stones are another ingenious way of dispersing the energy of an incoming projectile, since their added thickness and irregular surface will break up flying rocks and debris, reducing their momentum and the damage they can do. OK, so heavily reinforced towers and crenellated walls with a generous sprinkling of arrow slits isn't a bad start. But for Carcassonne, there's plenty more where that came from. Not content with one curtain wall surrounding the city, this city has two. The inner wall is much like the outer one, with merlins separated by crenels, arrow slits and rounded towers with boss stones. But looking at the two together, reveals even more ingenious strokes of defensive design. All the way around, the outer wall is lower than the inner one, and the Chemin de Ronde, the protected walkway, is only protected from the outside. No parapet or barrier on the inner edge of the walkway means that any assailants breaching the outer walls would be thoroughly exposed to defenders on the inner walls, who have gravity on their side too. The space in between the two city walls is called the Lys, or Lists. There's nothing special about them, they're just a stretch of empty space, but more exposed distance for attackers to have to cover. In times of peace, jousts were held in these open spaces, giving rise to the phrase, joining the lists. With the walls themselves so strong, it'd be natural for any attackers to focus in on the weakest points, gateways where you have to have a gap in the wall for access to the city during peacetime. And for that reason, the gateways are kept few in number and are very very heavily reinforced. To start with, Barbicans guard access to each of the town's gateways. These are basically expanded sections of the walls and lists that are especially heavily fortified with towers and arrow slits. The open areas they enclose, which any breaching attackers would have to pass through, would be a focal point for defensive fire and fighting. There were once four Barbicans protecting the gateways around the city. One, the Ord Barbican, is now destroyed but it had an important role in protecting the city's precious access to water from the River Ord. Placed entirely outside the city walls, the circular Barbican was a purpose-made arena that attackers would have had to capture before approaching the gateway on that side. Another Barbican protects the Port Narbonnaise, the Narbonne Gate, 
which is the city's main entrance and the only one accessible by road. This gate is the most heavily protected of all. It has two rounded gatehouse towers, with the same arrow slits and boss stones as on the walls, but with additional pointed beak shapes at the front, intended to deflect and reduce the force of a battering ram. The gate itself is protected with not one, but two portcullises. These need twice the amount of effort to penetrate, but also allow for a sneaky trick. Keeping the inner one lowered, attackers would press up against it in an attempt to get through, and the outer one could then be dropped down, trapping them in the small space between. And once they're there, openings in the ceiling above them, called murder holes, become very effective at doing murder. They are a common feature in castles and other defensive buildings, allowing deadly stuff to be simply dropped down onto the unsuspecting attackers below, with gravity doing all the work. Now you might have heard about murder holes, along with tales of defenders pouring boiling oil through them. But if so, I've got bad news for you. There isn't a single documented instance of oil being used. It was a rare resource, with much better uses elsewhere, so wouldn't be your go-to droppable murder weapon. Instead, equally murderous but more widely available substances would have been used, like stones, boiling water, scaldingly hot sand, and molten lead. With the fortified gateways being so important for the defence of the entire city, their operation wasn't left to chance either. Each of the two portcullises was controlled in a different gatehouse tower, with no easy communication between them. So, if one of the towers was breached by the enemy, they could only bring up one barrier, not both. A dry moat, two layers of curtain walls, barbicans, and a fantastically well-defended gateway are what our attackers have had to deal with so far. The protected space within is now home to tourist shops and cafes, but in times of conflict would have provided ample space to house a garrison and all the provisions they'd need for a siege. But wait, there's more. Carcassonne is a castle within a castle. Its central keep is the final line of defence in the centre of the Chateau Comtal. But before you get there, in a glorious stroke of defensive overkill, the chateau doubles up on many of the fortifications seen on the outer perimeter. Pressed up against one side of the outer walls, it makes best use of the steep hill on that side to create a sheer, insurmountable barrier. On the flatter ground within the city, the main entrance is defended by a large semicircular barbican overlooked by the chateau itself, the perfect place to concentrate attackers for ultimate defending efficiency. The gatehouse to the Barbican is intentionally backless too, so if it was overrun with enemies, they could still be shot at from the chateau walls. The chateau has a curtain wall of its own, replete with towers, and merlins and crannels and arrow slits for everybody. And in front of it is another dry moat. Today, a stone bridge allows access across the moat, but in the 13th century, this would have been a drawbridge that could be raised out of the way to totally isolate the chateau and its occupants. And, like the Port Narbonnais, the gatehouse is liberally equipped with double portcullises and murder holes. The walls of the chateau have a final treat for us too. Something you wouldn't ordinarily see unless you happen to be laying siege to the city. Wooden structures called hoardings. These shed-like buildings running along the top of the walls aren't a permanent feature. They'd be assembled from their flat-packed components whenever the threat was greatest. Today they're reconstructed along part of the walls and towers of the Chateau Comtal, but square post holes along all of the city's ramparts reveal just how extensive they could have been. The hoardings allowed defenders to stay protected, while also moving beyond the walls to improve their field of fire. A wide gap in the bottom of the structure acted like a continuous murder hole all the way along the hoarding. As soon as an attacker approaches the bottom of the wall, they're within dropping range. Being made of wood, they're naturally more flammable than the stone that makes up the rest of the fortifications, so the structures would have been covered with wet animal skins in an attempt to fireproof them. But you won't see them on more modern castles. Hoardings fell out of fashion and were replaced by permanent stone structures jutting out from the walls called machicolations. More sturdy, fireproof and not needing any assembly, machicolations could be considered the result of natural selection in defensive design. So, if you manage to get past the river, the steep slopes, the dry moat, 
The curtain wall with defensive towers, merlins and crannels, the arrow slits, the barbicans, the drawbridge, the reinforced gatehouses, the portcullises, murder holes and hoardings, then you might stand a chance of penetrating all the way to Carcassonne's core. But it'll take a pretty big force of will and an even bigger army to attempt it. Carcassonne lost its strategic importance in the 17th century when the French border finally moved south. No longer at risk from besieging attackers, the ancient city fell into disrepair while the lower town grew and flourished. In the 19th century, it was facing destruction. People wanted to rid the town of what was deemed an eyesore and make space for new, more useful buildings. If that had happened, there would now be nothing left of Carcassonne's incredible testament to military engineering. But luckily for us, it didn't. The city was saved by one of the founding fathers of conservation science, Violet Le Duc, who devoted his entire life to extensively renovating the entire walled city. The renovation was controversial at the time, and not every feature is exactly how it would have been in the 13th century. But thanks to Le Duc's efforts, we still have the city. Today, it's a thriving tourist town and a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site, attracting visitors and artists alike. It's safe and free to enter the outer walls and walk the crowded streets. Plus, there are excellent tours through the chateau and along the ramparts where you can get a good look at all of that siege science for yourself. I'd really, really recommend it. If you've enjoyed digging in to take a look at the defensive design of Carcassonne, please do give this video a like and let me know your favourite bit of military architecture in the comments below. You can subscribe to The Science here on YouTube and also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more of the science that surrounds us. Plus, we're on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us bring more everyday science directly to your eyeballs. Check out the links in the description and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.